strategies and techniques. Really a dynamic and fluid process of assessment and programming that will tie in a lot of resources from several different areas, talking from ACSM guidelines to um, some of the stuff from the Gray Institute to current evidence that's out there. One of the best things to know is that really it's a very evolving and very evolutionary understanding of prescription of exercise, which is exciting for us. Uh, there's a lot of empirical data that we'll talk about, uh, but there's also building evidence and growing research in, in these fields. So let's get started. So let's just uh, briefly talk about what is movement and understanding that movement is that act of changing physical location um, or changing a position. Uh, so this can range for multiple different people that we will interact with as physical therapists. If you're in an acute care setting, thinking about movement in a totally different way versus if you're working with a pediatric patient where now we're working on a lot of developmental movement patterns. We, we want to always come back to what does our patient need to do? How do they need to move? What are their movement patterns? Where do we see some ability that that needs to improve and get better? Characteristics of movement that we know really aren't arguable. Um, we know that it's dynamic, meaning that it requires movement within our bodies at a cellular level. It is dynamic in the sense that there's usually a purpose to our movements. Um, there is even some movement when we're sleeping. It's a fluid process with normal movement. That's what we look for. We look for fluidity. And that would be something within our scope of practice that really hopefully we're the movement professionals and we're assessing the um, ability of someone to synchronize their movements, to work in synergy with different muscle groups, and to make a movement fluid. So what could be a diagnosis that... Um, a medical diagnosis that you guys can think of that would have an abnormal fluid movement. Uh, what comes to mind first for me would be a neurological insult to the system. So someone that's undergone a cerebral vascular insult and they now don't have that nice fluidity and synchron synchronized movement pattern even to do normal activities of daily, move daily uh, living. When we start to get into patients that we're going to see in an orthopedic setting, we're looking at fluidity. So if we're talking about someone with a shoulder injury, how important is that scapulothoracic rhythm? How important does all of that play into us being able to reach up overhead, do our hair, swing a tennis racket, all of those kind of things? Um, we know that the body is really incompressible um, and that if it is compressed, that it's really not a good thing. And uh, we might not be worrying about treating those patients. So we know that movement is interconnected. Can you think of one muscle that you can move in isolation? And the answer is no. And we know that we require antagonists and agonists and support muscular system to make us move uh, as well as we can. But we also need to uh, understand that we might have to isolate things down and then we also might have to expand it into a global movement. A lot of movement is spiral, and if we go back to what does that um, fascial system integrating with that muscular system integrating with the neural system look like, it's very spiral in nature. Components of movement. We're, uh, we really are um, built segmentally to handle those effects of gravity. We talked about this early, early on in kinesiology, but understanding that we need absorption through that whole kinetic chain and we need the ability to disassociate, so absorb energy in different ways and key ways and so that we deal with that effect of gravity over time. This is one of those key components that we need to make sure that we're training people to uh, stay in that upright position for as long as they can and as easily as they can so that we're not using the wrong musculature to do that reaction forces. So those forces exerted by the ground upon an object or the body coming into contact with this. This would be that um, ability of us to absorb that. So if we're thinking about key things, we're thinking about walking, running, that anything that we're reacting with the ground, skating, so things like that. 
Uh, if we are, have that inability to do that, we can start to see that this can cause injury, pain, or not getting that shock absorption that we need. This is really a key part of our analysis is how well do they react with their um, ground. Mass, we know that the um, matter of a body in general will affect the ability of that body to move. Uh, increase in mass will, mass can increase congestion within the um, within the body and it can also, uh, so that can be in this, in the ways of you might see increased adhesions in their soft tissue, you might see lack of uh, fluid uh, movement of the lymphatic system. So now we're talking about excessive um, lymphedema pooling or we might have what's called lipodema. Um, we might see excessive scarring in that area too. So uh, if we have increased mass and compression, how can we help counteract that? What is our role as a physical therapist um, in that, in relationship to that? So I just want you to think about that and some things that we will talk about throughout the, the time we have together. And then momentum, right? So this is one of those amazing things that our body has. We, we, all, we talk a lot about this with <clears throat> all the different rockers built into the foot, uh, but it's really that, how well is, um, uh, do we have the ability to use momentum to help us to make our body and our movements uh, more efficient? So we start to see as there is stagnation, adhesions, injury, um, even just lack of movement, that this starts to get uh, really, really taxed. And we'll start to see that people lack that ability to use momentum. If you think about someone um, who is an elderly uh, person or patient and they're trying to get up out of a chair, how do they do that? They have to use a lot of, of their uh, muscle ability rather than using momentum, which is what you and I would do. So next time you guys get up out of a chair, know that. Uh, we know that when motion meets stillness that that's when we get injury and that's when we get some breakdown into the system. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to try to apply all of this to what we know and we're going to try to apply this within our programming. So we're going to always think about the body globally, what's the global effect, and then we're going to think locally what might be causing some of that inability of the body to move like it should. We're going to look at someone move and look at What's their energy expenditure? Are they fluid movers? If you ever watch a professional athlete that really is efficient with their movement, it's a beautiful act of mobility. Um, and then you watch someone who's injured or who's not as practiced. And, and that's not really, it's not a very good um, use of energy and requires more energy. Do they move in synergy with efficiency? And then where are we going to progress and regress that? So we'll dive into that a little bit more. I like this picture because it really does show what happens when we change our running mechanics and what happens if we start to get a little bit more uh, not as efficient and not as fluid with our movements and we start to see that uh, there's just a lot of really poor things that happen to our joints. So look at that knee, look at that hip. What's happening here at the ankle? Is there a lot of shock absorption in there? Not really. And then what does he have to do with his head? He has to start to get some of that mobility through there. So just some key things that we want to start to look for when we're, when we're doing that. So let's just talk about what influences our intervention. And it's oftentimes that current state of the patient. What are they walking in the door like? Are they energetic? Do they have lots of energy? Are they well hydrated? Um, or do they look exhausted? Are they extremely tired? Are they stressed out? Do they have that fear avoidance behavior? You know, are they depressed? All of these components will influence how you're going to go about treating someone and helping them really maximize their time with you and their time in rehab. If you think about the different stages, if you see someone who has a total knee replacement, you see them in the hospital, what is their state at that current point? They're probably very sleep deprived. Uh, they have had significant amount of pain medication. They've been under anesthesia. There might be a little bit of that worry um, 
You know, are they going to heal? Is there going to be infection? Uh, maybe they haven't been moving in such a long time, but there also could be hope because this might be the first time that they've ever felt like they might be able to move in a very long time without pain. So just all these different things that we're going to run into that will affect your ability to treat your patient. So I want you guys, as you're pre creating your program, creating programs for yourself, your loved ones, for your patients, what does that look like? Um, are you really creating uh, an energy drain? Are you asking too much of your patient or your client? Or are you facilitating that healing environment? And then a key thing to know is how does your patient respond to stress? Uh, I'll give you an example. One of my first um, clients, I was a personal trainer in my at U of A for a long time, but one of my first clients came in and she was ready to go. She was super excited and I was really excited. And so I had her do three sets of 10 squats. I didn't think that was really that big of a deal, but I made a mistake. I didn't ask enough questions. I didn't really know what her baseline was. And she came in the next day, or sorry, a couple days later, and she still couldn't walk. She was so, so incredibly sore. And so my programming didn't really create a good environment for her, and it didn't really facilitate a good environment for her. Um, now, talk about the overload principle. I think I did a really good job at that, but maybe a little bit too soon. So think about that with your patients as you go through, through their um, time with you. We want to up the gain. So this is where salience matters. A lot of studies have been shown, and more in the neural population, but it's still the same. It's a principle that, that carries through. It doesn't matter if it's a neuro or if it's ortho or if it's peds. It's that salience matters, meaning that if you enjoy what you're doing, the basal ganglia actually is more activated, and so it releases more dopamine, it releases more endorphins, and so we actually up the gain as far as that neuromotor planning goes, and we get to relate that to our patients' wants and our needs. So it's pretty awesome tie-in that way, and so think about that. If any of you have gone through rehab, or maybe you were in rehab, think about the people that uh, did the best. Those were the ones probably meeting their wants, their needs, their goals. Um, so keep coming back to that. Okay, guys. Keep coming all th all throughout your programming. Maybe initial eval. Um, every time they come in the door, you're assessing that individual for what they're giving you that day. So you might have to adjust your programming based on what that individual is giving you so that you actually have a really good way to mark that if they're ready for what you're you want to give them that day. We look at the individual, we look at their movement patterns. Are they a good mover? Um, are they a novice mover? Do they need a little bit more coaching on how to move? Um, should everyone exercise? Can everyone exercise? Absolutely. Um, so just keep that in mind. What's their, what's their behavior and relationship with exercise and health and, and wellness? Um, and really try to be a creator and a motivator of that. Try not to make them feel horrible or bad. They're, they're uh, you know, not going to really appreciate that. And, and patients need a lot of motivation to change behavior. Nourishment is extremely important. And that's something that I would really suggest that you guys start to read up on and study up on is what's the effect of all the things that could be causing inflammation in the body. If we have injury, we have inflammation. And so how can we really affect that? And then rest and recovery. Extremely important that we're getting good night's sleep, enough sleep. I know that a lot of us, when we're going through a rigorous schooling or if we're going through a rigorous sport event, um, training that towards that end of that season, end of that schooling term, you're exhausted. And so what does that do for you? Your performance changes. So just keep coming back to that. Maybe your patient is just stat, like planning out. They're not getting better. They made great gains their first, second, third treatment with you. But by that fourth, fifth treatment, they're just not making gains. And so come back to that. Are they getting enough rest and recovery in between that? Make sure you're really getting them to work on all of those components to get to their, their end goal. And then function. Really, this is the heart of our plan is to get our patients back to 
what they want their wants and needs are, but also what we know are their needs. And so, um, and this might also be a good platform for you to introduce different areas where they can carry on what you're doing with them. Remember that functional movement patterns are three-dimensional. We rarely move in one dimension. Um, even if you're doing a straight plane exercise, think of uh, what we learned in gait and how much of the muscle activity acts on just to prevent you from falling forward on your face. Oh my gosh, there's a huge, huge typo right there. I really apologize. That's supposed to be three-dimensional. Um, remember that it's dynamic, uh, it's patient driven. This can also be a way where we can tie in and make it more salient, but also make it a little bit more fun. So keep coming back to that for you, for yourselves. And then what are we going to do? Well, we're going to make a plan for our, for our patient. This is just kind of an overview. We're going to, uh, collect information. So they're going to tell us, they're going to tell us how much they've been lifting, how much they've been exercising, uh, are they going, are they open to your suggestions or is this going to be kind of, you're going to intersperse what you want them to do by the end, by the, by, um, but throughout that whole plan of care. You're there to establish that level of injury and also level of health. This is key in, in prescribing exercise. You want to examine not just their local movement. So how do I isolate my shoulder movement, but how do I bend over and tie my shoe? How do I put my jacket on and off? Those kind of things. You're looking at the local considerations. So are they hiking up that shoulder? Are they really limping? Are they taking weight off of one of their legs? What's happening? You're going to tie all that into it. You're going to integrate all of this. You're going to design movement sequences. And you're going to listen for reaction. One of the key areas I want you guys to remember is that we're going to watch transformational zones. If you think about how many of you tried multi-plane lunges. So you've lunged forward and back. You've lunged to the side and back. Maybe you did that rotational lunge for the first time and back. And going out was fine, but trans that transformational zone of moving back to the uh, center out of that was was difficult. So we want to watch that ability of our patients to change direction, motor planet, accept weight. What's their speed? What's their reaction ability as they're doing that? Okay, we're going to talk about global movements, which is those activity limitations and participation restrictions. It's very important that you guys understand that these are all interchangeable, and that we're talking about work, sports, recreation, ADL. So the movements in rehab are going to mimic that. So a lot of times it's going to be your multi-joint exercises that we're using drivers, and we'll get into what a driver is in just a little bit, to really drive movement and the patterns that we want to, to get into that. A local movement is more isolated. It may or may not be the cause of pain. Um, and just, I want you guys to think about how does that local um, influence that ability of your patient to achieve their wants and their needs. So if we think about how many of us have restricted dorsiflexion, uh, quite a bit, but how many of us can still walk, we can still squat down, so uh, we might have a local restriction, but globally we're still able to move through movement patterns. And so we need to really dive in. Is that harmful? Do I need to address that? Do I need to address it now? When I look at motor learning, I look at what are my types of tasks. And there's three types of tasks, right? Discrete, serial, and continuous. So discrete would be what we would do as local. It's one specific task. You're telling your patient one specific thing. Serial is a combination. So if you think about, I can do a bicep curl. So if everyone, you guys are doing a bicep curl, Oftentimes, we'll start in full supination. So we're in supination, we're doing a bicep curl. But what happens if you let your hands just stick in neutral? So our palms are facing the inside of our body. Now we're going from a from neutral into supination as we're doing that. So it's a serial test. We're adding things. And then continuous is now we're going to make things maybe more dynamic. So we're asking that. When we look at task dimensions, we're going to look at uh, closed versus open environment. So what does that mean? Uh, what does that mean to you guys right now? If I say I need to work in a closed environment instead of an open environment. Closed environment would be that they there's reduction in distraction. There's walls, uh, that there is a smaller area to move in. An open environment would be a big gym or outside, uh, lots of stuff going on. 
We want to look at um, what's the variability in the environment. So we, are they just training and they're training really well in your gym, but then they go out and they aren't able to do that? Well, maybe we're not doing the right thing. We want to look at is the body stable? Um, are we just working in a static environment or are we doing a more dynamic? So if you think about lunges, what would be a static lunge? Yep, it would just be standing right there. What would be a dynamic lunge? Well, I could go out and back or I could walk and do a walking lunge. Planks, same thing. I can do a static plank or I could do a walking plank. I can start to do that. Now I can add in objects, right? So I can look at those task dimensions because that's really what we do in function, don't we? We manipulate objects. Think about what you did when you got dressed this morning. Well, you probably uh, hopefully put your underwear on um, and then your shirt and your socks and your shoes and you tie shoes. So how many different movement patterns are needed just to get dressed? Significant amount. Uh, things that I want you guys to just kind of um, look at is looking at those different feedback boxes and those practice boxes and just taking a look at those. Uh, no need to memorize them, just really there for you guys to understand that. So let's just reiterate. Discrete is an action or movement with recognizable beginning and an end. Um, a serial task is those discrete movements that are combined into a sequence. Um, and then a continuous is that repetitive, uninterrupted, so like walking and that kind of thing. Okay, we're going to jump into the movement variables. These are going to be essential for you guys to just understand the lingo. You already start to think of like this if you're working out at the gym or if you ever were a rehab tech, you did things like this. Now we're going to, we're going to uh, really focus it in on uh, what do these mean. So action, there's nine global movements that we can all um, accept. Environment, Position, driver, direction, height, distance, load, rate, duration. We're going to dive into each of those independently of each other, okay? By the end, I want you to make sure that you can uh, know this chart inside and out, understand, um, you know, the different positions, understand the different drivers. How are you going to combine those to make an exercise that's valuable to your, to your patient? Okay, so action, gait, walking, we just did that. Squatting, lunging, reaching, pushing, pulling, lifting, jumping, jogging, and running. All of these actions, now we can start to build exercises based on that. So what would be a push exercise? Uh, let's think of an upper body push exercise. Okay, so first one that comes to me would be uh, possibly like a chest press or a push-up. Good. What would be a pull exercise for the upper body? Yeah, any type of row. Um, so what would be a push exercise for the lower body? So uh, maybe like a squat. Um, you could think about uh, what kind of machine, maybe we're using a machine to do a lower body exercise, what could be a push exercise, maybe a, a leg press machine. What about a pull for the lower body? Maybe uh, like a hamstring curl, that type of thing. Uh, maybe like a straight leg, so we do four-way hip, uh, you'll see a four-way hip a lot of times. So those are often different things. A lift. So if we're lifting things, those might be our bigger movements. Think about Olympic lifting. What would be a lift we might do? We might combine that, right? So we might think about what's a power clean. So a power clean could be a pull, right? It could be a push because you're pushing into the ground. It's a lift. You're lifting up overhead. Uh, we can combine all these different things to make really phenomenal exercises and break down what our movement patterns are for our patient. Environment, so we're in, on, or what's our type of surface that we're thinking about. I love this because this is one of those things that I, oh, I had the really phenomenal PTs out there, guys. Think about this for, our, for the patient right away. Um, they really apply what is their environment. Uh, think about my uh, patients with Parkinson's that I've treated, and oftentimes they have a hard time getting in and out of their sofa. And... It's not like the new sofas. A lot of them have sofas from the 1950s, which were very, very little and very short. So they're short to the ground. They've probably lost all of that spring. And so how do you mimic that? How do you make sure that I'm mimicking that to, to now help them with strategies to be able to do that at home? What about an ice skater or a bobsledder? So now we add in a slippery surface, and it's not just about uh, the being on a land-based environment. So how are we really going to to do that? Um, this is also a great area of progression. So adding in, what can you guys think of would be a, a change of environment that we can do for our patient to progress them? It would be unstable. 
So it might be something like a BOSU ball. Uh, maybe they're standing on a half foam roller or foam. This really drives at helping them with proprioception and challenge. We want to challenge them in our, in our rehab setting. Okay, position. Okay, I'll be honest. This is like my favorite of all of the movement variables because this is the one that will uh, really change your ability to influence a patient in the most positive way possible. Uh, a lot of us have postural deficits, right? We have forward head posture. A lot of our patients are going to have forward head posture. So what can we do? We can change the way in which the position of the exercise is being performed to put them in a better postural alignment. Beautiful things. So think about kneeling. What a wonderful thing to think about kneeling. Think about kneeling just for um, people's job environments. But kneeling is one of the most underutilized exercise um, positions that uh, is out there. And it really, you guys, if you start to incorporate this, you're going to see great gains. You're going to see really good postural control. You're going to see good postural alignment. And you're going to be very pleased because it's going to challenge your patient. And they're going to like it because it's new and it opens them up. So that's my challenge to you. I want you to try adding kneeling into your programming. It's a great core exercise. So just uh, be ready for that. Uh, think about transitions. Are they transitioning in and out of positions? Um, can we train in those transitions? So we talked about the transformational zone. Building on tasks. So we might work a little bit in sitting, and then we might work from sit to stand. Now we're working from sit to stand to lunge. So all these different things. Uh, and then where we might start if someone is an acute injury. That might be where we start in sideline, might start in supine. That might be their, their best position because gravity is not pulling down on them as much and they have much more support. Try to choose the position that your patient prefers first. This is a great strategy to make your patients feel better, make them buy into you. It's part of the McKinsey method to choose the preferred movement pattern or preferred position of the patient and exercise there. And they've shown really great results in studies that that is one of our clinical practice patterns that we know is to exercise the patient first in those positions. But make sure then you're starting to get them out of that. Okay, what's a driver? You're going to hear Dr. K and I talk a lot about drivers, and this is something that's going to create a reaction. It's a cue. It's an anatomical position that we might say. So we might say, okay, go ahead and squat down, Susie. Susie squats down, and we see that Susie really is having a hard time with maintaining that good core activation. Uh, so we say, okay, Susie, with this one, I want you to uh, drive your hands up overhead. And so now I've just created a, a arm driver and I've created now tension into the system and her squat looks a lot better. I might have someone reach down at ankle height because I want them to get more glute recruitment or more quad recruitment. So I can use those drivers to record, recruit muscles like I want them to be recruited, but I can also use them as that really unconscious cue for someone to move in the pattern that we want them to move in. Direction, this is an easy one. This is where we usually go. I want you to step anterior. I want you to step lateral. I want you to rotate to the side. This can be a, a really nice strategy for you to document how far were they able to lunge. And you'll see this is a, a nice clock or compass. A lot of clinics will have these so you can now measure how far they were able to improve. So if someone could only lunge 30 centimeters and then, uh, you know, in four sessions, now they're lunging 90 centimeters. What a beautiful transition that you've just made. And you've written a really good goal around that. And they have no pain. Your patient is really happy. Height. This is a really good way to increase someone's demand. So um, if you think about progression and regression, changing the height of something can really add in some a little bit more difficulty. It's also good to think about in relationship to patients' function when they're walking up and down stairs all day. Um, what about upper extremity? Do they need to be able to reach up overhead? Are they overhead athlete and they need to swing up high? So what's that vertical coordinate that you're concerned about? Distance is that horizontal component, so really thinking about um, how far they're going. Oh, sorry, I did that with direction. So we're going to just combine the two, uh, direction and distance, which we would often do, right, in, in that. Are you using a metric system or standards, standard measurement? So be descriptive in what you're talking about. 
especially when you're writing goals or you're doing initial eval, we want to make sure we understand that. But it also is a really nice way to introduce someone to a movement pattern that they need to be able to do but they haven't done in a long time. And you can start to go just initial range and mid-range for those acute injuries. And then by the end of their rehab time, with their, you're doing end range exercises. Load. So I'll tell you guys, this is probably one of the ones that you're going to go to right away for progression and regression when we're going to want you to think about position we're going to want you to think about direction. We're going to want you to think about initial and mid-range um, and think about that in relationship to regression rather than only just thinking about load. Uh, a lot of times load will help with that approximation and we'll dive into the proprioceptors but the Golgi manzonis they like to be mashed and so to get them to turn on they like to be there likes to be compression into that so we might think about a little bit of load even though their movement pattern isn't is incredibly ideal will help them with that joint approximation and understanding where their body is in space. Starting with body weight, very light load, and then progressing. How do we know where to start with that? So someone comes in, you have a 56 year old female, she comes in to see you, how do you know where to start? You want to do some upper extremity exercises with her. Yeah, a lot of people are just going to go, I'm going to give her the five pound dumbbells. Well, I'm going to challenge you just to think about really if you ask enough questions, she'll tell you how much she's lifting in her day or if she's an exerciser, how much she's lifting. So if she's, if she's pushing uh, 20 to 25 pounds and you give her five, uh, now you're not really doing the right thing by her and she's probably not that impressed by you. So let's just think about that. Rate. Okay, really love rate. It's one of those that will get those proprioceptors to turn on. It's essential to getting back uh, momentum and the use of momentum in a body. Thinking about how fast can this happen? What's the proprioceptive response? And how can I train this? Can I train this early? Do Should I wait till the very end of my rehab? Uh, I'll tell you that the answer is probably no. But am I going to train fast rate at end of ranges? I want you to think about that. Probably not if there's an acute injury. So um, if we have an acute injury, probably not. But once they start to get some of that healing down, we need to start to try to get those proprioceptors to fire in all different ways. This is probably talked about a lot as far as our patients go for duration and when you think about cardiovascular training, right? And then we also think for sets and reps. So we know this is common dialogue for the for us. This is one of the areas where we get lazy as physical therapists. And so we need to make sure we're constantly coming back to, am I really challenging my patient? Am I applying what they need to do duration? Do they need to hold a really fine motor task for a certain amount of time? Are they running a marathon? Much different for both of those, right? Okay, guys, so in this next section, we're, section, we're going to talk about applying our principles. And uh, so gear up. It's a, a little bit longer, and I would not say it's that exciting, but I want you guys just to know these, own them, think about them, integrate them into your brain so that when you're out there being a wonderful PT, you're coming back to our principles of exercise and movement and understanding that these are those uh, fundamental truths or propositions that really serve as those foundational system um, for our belief of how we're, we're, we're doing and prescribing exercise. I'll tell you, things just keep changing and keep getting better and we keep getting uh, more and more um, comprehensive in what we know. So what I tell you today will probably be different in, in several years from now. Um, but just keep coming back to trying to own what what is out there and how do we define um, the different principles that we use to guide us. Okay, so individuality, really that optimum benefits occur when programs meet the individual needs and capacities of the participant. Salience really does matter. Um, specific recruitment in synergistic movement patterns matter. So if I have uh, my husband, Eric, who uh, is one of the most stiff people on the face of the planet right now, go do yoga, he's actually not going to love it. And it's his 